Okay, ladies and gentlemen, apologies for the for the delay, but uh, this time in Washington, east-west travel is uh, sometimes difficult. So we, uh, but we're delighted that uh, Representative Jay Inslee, uh, who represents the first congressional district in Washington State, is able to join us uh, as as advertised, fresh from the. Uh, from the, uh, uh, I think, very difficult negotiations on the uh, on the energy bill, so we look forward to hearing his views on that. Just a, a quick word of, uh, of introduction. Uh, uh, Representative Inslee has, has been serving the first district. He had also previously served in Congress as a, in 92-94 as a representing the fourth district in Washington State. Uh, he's been a, a, a strong advocate of environmental protection and, and uh, uh, dealing with uh, the, the effects of, of climate change and and other uh, and, and energy and reducing energy dependence. He um, has served on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and uh, worked very uh, diligently to promote a vision of a clean energy future and uh, the, the new Apollo Energy Act as a number of other uh, pieces of legislation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In uh, March of 2007, he was appointed to the 15-member uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, and uh, he served on that uh, select committee, and which has really been uh, instrumental, set up by uh, Speaker Pelosi to uh, to uh, develop the uh, legislative uh, dimensions of a strategy on dealing with uh, the climate change and enhancing uh, our energy uh, and uh, energy diversification and, and moves towards uh, greater independence. So um, let me. Uh, previously in his career, he served as a public. He was a public servant. Uh, he was a state legislator and prosecutor in Seattle, Washington, and. Uh, he and his entire family still live in Washington State, so we we didn't uh, we have a, a perspective uh, not quite from the uh, uh, the literal areas of uh, of the of the Arctic, uh, but certainly a state close by and heavily uh, influenced by and concerned about uh, uh, about the developments in the Arctic region. So, Representative Inslee, thank you for joining us. And uh, just for the journalists who are here, this will be a, a non-attribution uh, off the record. But if you want to speak later, as uh, Representative Staff is here, we can. If you want to have, if anyone did want to uh, quote him or have a, 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 if he has time, I think we can, he can to make any statement for the record. But this will be off the record. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, this is a, a treat to get to join you. I'm amazed that people are still here this time of the afternoon. But it is an interesting subject. I'm particularly interested in uh, this, and I'll mention. Uh, why? Number one, I th the only real qualifications I have to address this, this great group on this subject is that I represent the first woman to ski alone to the North Pole. And uh, she wrote a book about it, and I'm terribly embarrassed. I believe her name is Tayer, and it is a wonderful account of a great adventure, the first person, to, I believe woman, to ski alone to the North Pole. And I recommend it, and hopefully by the time we're done I'll have her name so you can read, read her book. So that gives me credibility on this subject, that I have a constituent who's actually traversed the now disappearing ice to get there. And there's a certain symmetry to this story. The reason I mention it, that there are some ironies, because on her trip to the North Pole, uh, a polar bear took particular interest in her uh, as an hors d'oeuvre, not as a companion. And uh, it's a great story in her book about how her dog essentially warded off this polar bear to allow my constituent to get to the North Pole. Well, that was several years ago. Now jump ahead. Now her congressman is trying to, uh, despite that incident, trying to save the habitat for the polar bear, even though sometimes they are tended to munch on my constituents. So there's a certain irony here about kind of the work I've been engaged in. But the reason I'm doing that is, is uh, in part, but just in part, uh, due to my desire to keep the polar bears uh, on Earth. And I think they are in great, great danger right now because we know uh, about the danger of the shrinking ice cap. We know that they are dependent in a significant part of their life cycle on the existence of life that basically is their hunting platform. And as that ice uh, disappears, and university scientists, I'm from Seattle, that's one of the hotbeds of research on this. They've concluded, as you know, that, that within this century you may have essentially a disappearance of the Arctic ice shelf, perhaps even, even as soon as in a decade or two, at least during the summer months. So the polar bears are in great, great uh, danger to actually uh, become extinct during, during my grandchild. My first grandchild is now four and a half months old during his lifetime. He may not be able to, to talk about polar bears to his kids or grandkids, and I think that's a sad thing. But that's not the principal reason that I've been engaged in this effort to get Congress to develop a new clean energy uh, uh, economy. The principal reason I'm engaged in that effort is that 
humans are endangered by the disappearance of the Arctic ice cap. This is an, an anthropomorphic selfishness on our part that we have a great stake in the preservation of that ice cap. And the reason is, is that that is the great modulating a heat shield, if you will, for the United States. You know, I remember when John Glenn, Glenn when he was orbiting, those of you who are old enough remember, his heat shield, there was a great question whether it essentially came off and he was going to burn up when he came back into the atmosphere. And to those of you who will remember, it was pretty amazing because the only person who didn't know that, that his heat shield had maybe come off, was John Glenn. They didn't tell him. I thought that was kind of interesting. We all knew it, but he didn't know it. Uh, turns out he was okay. The heat shield stayed. But unfortunately, our great heat shield, which is the Arctic ice cap, which reflects massive amounts of energy back right now, as, this, as it disappears, uh, I think it's three to five times more energy will be absorbed by the, by the dark seawater now when the ice cap disappears. That is our heat shield for humanity because that, because it reflects that light, now will be absorbed. Now we humans, even though we may never step foot at the North Pole, will be endangered by the fact that that heat will be absorbed. And that includes Midwestern farmers whose crop yields will go down. That's um, people who rely on the forest in Washington State, which is now being eaten by bugs alive. Um, that is people in North Africa who will see increasing desertification and the wars that will break out as a result of mass migrations associated with that. The polar bear is a symbol of humans being um, endangered. And canary in the coal mine, of course, is a cliche, but I think it's not too far off as what the occasion is that we're engaged in here. And, much, uh, and, I, and a great irony is developing that I think needs to be sort of cut off at the beginning. The irony would be, as soon as I read about um, the disappearance of the, uh, of, the, of the Arctic ice shelf, I immediately started hearing about squabbles between nations to grab the oil and gas underneath the disappearing ice cap, with no sense of irony about that from those who wanted to do that. To me, there's a great sense of irony that basically because of our dependence on, on oil, we destroy the Arctic ice cap. We expose us to a great danger associated with that. Our immediate response is <laughs> for the nations not to figure out how to stop that, but how to go accelerate that by increasing access to the oil and gas under the Arch Arctic ice shelf. That seemed a little ironic to me that we sort of burn down our neighbor's house and the first reaction we have is how can we get in there and salvage some of these coins that may not have, have melted in the fire? So to me, the first reaction ought to be, how are we going to work internationally to solve this problem and prevent the destruction of that environment? And we are now engaged, literally as I speak, in that effort in the U.S. House. So let me address what we're up to right now. We believe it's time for the United States to fulfill its historic destiny to join and lead the world in an effort to, start to stop uh, global climate change. And I can report to you we are now fully engaged in that effort after a long drought. Uh, if you watch, if you're a fan of Western movies, uh, there's always the, the plot about the town that's in great peril, and this sheriff rides up when there's a new sheriff ta in town. And the, the saying is there's a new sheriff in town. Well, I can tell you at the White House there's a new sheriff in town. And we have a leader who's now kindled this action and spirit of, of vision of America really getting off the dime. We went, the Commerce Committee I served in, and we, met and we went and met with Barack Obama the day before yesterday at the White House. And he was abundantly clear that he's going to put his shoulder to the wheel to help us fight, uh, to, to pass uh, a clean energy jobs bill this year that will simultaneously reduce our addiction to Middle Eastern oil, stop or at least slow down global warming, and create millions of jobs in this country. And that's what we're in the, the cause of doing right now. This is a heavy lift because it is a new idea, but I believe we have every chance of success, and I'll give you the broad contours of the bill we want to pass. First, we want to have a bill that caps the amount of CO2 going in the atmosphere, put a hard limit on it, just like we did on sulfur dioxide, and just like we did in acid rain, then charge polluters to, in fact, buy at auction over time the permits for those limited, scarce resources. Um, and we think that's only fair that the polluters have to pay for the pollution associated with this. Now, there are those who said this will wreck the U.S. economy, hogwash. 
Uh, we have seen this movie before on sulfur dioxide. When we came to stop acid rain, people said, can't do it. It will ruin the U.S. economy. But we did it. And the reason we did it is because Americans are very innovative, we're very entrepreneurial, and there are very few technological challenges that, given a chance, we can't solve. And what happened with sulfur dioxide is we limited CO SO2, and Americans went to work creating new technologies on how to solve this problem, and they cut in half the cost of solving the problem, and we were spectacularly successful in that effort. We intend to recreate that success story, but this time with carbon dioxide. The model is proven. It's just a different gas that's involved in this situation. We intend to supplement that effort with a renewable electrical standard, which will call for a percentage, and that is in flux right now, somewhere between 15 and 25 percent, that will come from re clean, renewable sources of electricity, a portion of which will come from efficiency. And, of course, we know efficiency is the first fuel. It's always the cheapest. It's always the fastest way to effectively uh, clean up your energy economy. We intend to have a low-carbon fuel standard, which will drive uh, our transportation fuels to systems that put out much less carbon over uh, their life cycle. We intend to have a significant investment pool in research and development to help move forward in that regard. We intend to have a green bank, which will be a, a permanent lending source of capital to help these new you know, entrepreneurial companies across what they call the valley of death, where they get venture capital, they invent the prototype, but then they can't get financing for the first commercial plant. We intend to help them across the, the valley of death. We hope we will have a provision to accelerate the building of high-capacity electrical grids in the United States because we know improving our transport transmission system is pivotally important to getting access to, you know, concentrated solar energy in the southwest, to move it to markets on the west and east coast, to move Midwest wind to the east coast. We've got to have a national grid system that, in fact, can move that. We intend to improve our efficiency standards, and we started. By the way, we had a great start in the stimulus bill on this whole revolution. We put $70 billion, the first real investment ever in America, in real dollars for clean energy. And I was very, very happy with that. And it was uh, basically the inspiration of Barack Obama that got us to this point. So we've made sort of a down payment. The way I look at this, this is sort of akin to the original Apollo project. In fact, if you want to know what I really think about this, I wrote a book about it. It's called um, uh, Apollo's Fire. And basically, we think we need to recreate. Thanks, Lou. We need to recreate. Um, we need to recreate the investment that Uncle Sam made in those technologies. And we made the first investment of that in the stimulus bill. And I kind of liken it that we've sort of now designed the Redstone rocket, right? Which is the first rocket that we use to launch, a, you know, a little satellite. But now we've got to finance the real Apollo project. And that's why we're going to take revenues from auction of these permits in this uh, clean energy uh, system we're going to adopt and put those revenues to work in an R&D platform to get this done. So we are now trying to develop a full consensus. Um, it isn't there yet. This is a very complicated bill, and we're a diverse country, and we're working to get that consensus. There will be lots of trade-offs. I can promise you the bill will not be as I would have written it, uh, but I do believe there's every reason to believe it's going to be successful. And we are going to keep our eyes and our prize on the prize in doing this. And, you know, Barack Obama made one of the most telling pitches I've ever heard a president made when we were at the White House the other day. He listened to a lot of the concerns of members about the bill. These are sincere, legitimate. But he said, you know what? you got a tough job when you're in Congress. You're in the jets a lot of time. People criticize you a lot. At times can be a trying job. But once in a while, you have a chance to do something really historic. And this is a very historic moment for us where America can really fulfill its destiny to do what we did in World War II. In World War II, the, the world needed America. It needed us to be the tool, you know, to be the arsenal of democracy, to provide the world with the tools to beat back some forces of darkness, and we fulfilled that destiny. And I believe now it is America's destiny to again assist the world in becoming the arsenal of clean energy. And when we fulfill that destiny, destiny it will be great for America, and it's going to be great for the rest of the world, and most importantly, it will be great for our grandkids too. And it's going to be great for the U.S. economy 
when we get into the game to, to have an honest competition with Germany about selling solar cells and an honest competition with China to build lithium-ion powered electric cars and an honest competition with our friends in Denmark to provide wind turbines. Wind turbines. And when we do that, it's going to help our economy a lot and create a lot of jobs. So that's kind of what's cooking. Could I stand for some easy questions or Absolutely, please, general yeah. criticisms no. here? Yes. Oh, and if you could just wait for the microphone and, and just identify yourself. Thank you. I'm a foot soldier in what you're doing. Good. Okay. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And for you folks about talking about carbon, we produce more carbon from our power plants to screw up the rest of the world than probably most other states. Here's the whole point. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt back in 42 or 43, and uh, Yolston, uh, Ambassador Michael straightened me out one time about this, said, when you're fighting the enemy, look to Norway. Here's the whole point. Why try to reinvent things that the Norwegians have been doing for years? They've ingrained the environment. I've got two grandkids over there. Ingrained the environment. They know how to do it. Not everything, because nobody knows how to do it. My suggestion is get yourself and a few senators and maybe Barack Obama up to Norway and see what has been done. Because they know how to do it. I brag about Norway all the time in North Carolina, and they realize that, hey, we don't have to reinvent it again. So. Well, I'm a real fan of Norway for a lot of reasons, one of which is the most Norwegian city in the United States is Paulsville, Washington, which is in my district, that has more old Norwegian fishermen in it than any place in the, in the country, and, and it has a Norwegian theme to the entire city. So I'm a real fan of Norway. Uh, your point is, though, is an important one. There are great lessons to be learned from other countries, and including Norway, which has done incredible work in science and economic development. And, and, may, and I'd say one that no other country, I don't think, has been so helpful to other countries in their development as Norway. And we're very appreciative of the Norwegian citizens who've shown the way on how to help the developing world move forward. So there's a lot of reasons to be a good fan of Norway. But there are great lessons from Europe in general not just Norway. Um, let me list some of them that we can learn. Number one, you need to have a limit on the amount of gas that goes out. You can't just do taxes. You have to have an absolute limit like we now are proposing on the amount of gases that go out. And that is a lesson from Norway and Europe that we have to have a cap on the amount of carbon dioxide goes out. That's number one. Number two, a lesson from Europe is that efficiency is incredibly economic productive economically productive. Norway, Denmark, a whole host of the other European countries have squeezed enormous efficiency out of their systems with relatively common sense measures such as building codes and incentive for consumers and the like. Number three, a lesson from Europe is that you can do this and grow your economy. You know, uh, you look at, 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 at Great Britain, you know, they've grown their economy in large part because of the industrial base that they've been able to grow in some of these clean tech economic um, uh, models. So yes, and by the way, the, Europe made some mistakes. They made a mistake of giving away all their permits and having bad information when they started. And we're not going to follow that. We're going to learn from the mistakes they've made too. So sometimes it's good to put second, let the other guy first, go first. That's so another good question. Uh, Sherry Goodman. Congressman, thank you very much for the leadership that you have sh shown on uh, clean energy and, and climate change. Uh, and in the uh, creating the arsenal of the clean energy economy, um, I'd like to briefly mention an effort by a group of retired generals and admirals that will be uh, released in about 10 days, May 18th on uh, powering America's defense, mm -hmm. energy, and the risk to national security by a, a military advisory board at uh, CNA that produced a report on climate change, mm -hmm. national security, and the uh, threat of climate change two years ago. Um, and they are now prepared to and will be talking about um, energy as a, from, the, from the point of view of reducing the threats to our national energy posture, mm -hmm. our national security, and uh, using 
America's military, which is the single largest energy mm -hmm. user in the in the U.S., as a way to innovate towards that clean energy economy, mm -hmm. using the military as a test bed and an incubator uh, and an innovator for new technologies, as it has done, as you've noted over many over many years, mm -hmm. the innovation both technological and cultural. So I think that's going to be another tool in this arsenal of clean energy uh, as we proceed through the debates here over the next year. Well, I'm very appreciative of you and the General's work on this. It's been most enlightening. And let me tell you that now is the time for uh, the Generals to uh, assault the last bastion they need to – I'm going to give them a mission statement, if you will, even though many of them are retired. I hope they will volunteer for the duty of sharing some of their wisdom and experiences and insights with the people who represent them on Capitol Hill in the next week. Um, uh, this, and, and I'm not lobbying any particular position, but I hope generals will share what they know right now with very important members of the U.S. Congress, because they have very important insights on this subject, and they have been very, very clear on the threats that we face as a result of this problem. We had this letter from 20, 20 retired generals about the security threats associated with this if we do not act. And you're entirely right, the DOD now, their mission is to, is to not have such a long logistic tail associated with exactly. God knows how many gallons you have to burn a gas to get one gallon of gas to a rock. And if we can figure out technologies that free them for that, it's going to be a wonderful thing for their missions as well. Absolutely. So their, their help in getting my colleagues to understand the duality of this, of these benefits, will be very, very important. And I'm giving them a mission statement here. <laughs> well, thank you. I think they're up to the Thank task. you. I know they are. <laughs> and, and they have great credibility. Sure. Yeah. We get any other softball questions? There's a lady. Here. Yeah. Um, in addition to the energy bill, I was wondering what you thought the prospects were on passing uh, the bill to regulate black carbon. Yeah, actually, in the bill, we have a um, – in the bill is – a. The guts of a bill I've introduced to start a study and eventual potential regulation of black carbon. It is in the bill, in the base bill right now. So cross your fingers. We hope it will stay there. And we know how important this is. The new science has, in, in fact, been shockingly disturbing that black carbon, because it absorbs all this energy when it gets up in the ice, is a major part of this, of this destructive pattern. And we also know how it's associated with health issues as well. So we've got to get to the bottom of this and have some regulatory approach to it, and it will, as of the moment, it's, it's in the bill. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Ladislaw. Congressman, thanks so much for being here today. It's really uh, great to have you here. Um, I really appreciated your intro comments. I work in the uh, – sorry, I'm Sarah Ladislaw. I work in the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. Um, oftentimes things like climate change seem so far away because some of the more aggressive changes that are taking place happen in the, in the Arctic region of the world or mm -hmm. the changes that we're talking about happen over time frames out to 2050. Right. I'm just wondering, you know, from your perspective and what you're seeing on the Hill, people from all over the world come here to ask us, how are these perspectives changing in Congress? Are these are, – are the awareness of these issues being here and now things we need to deal with today um, actually really resonating with more and more people? Uh, I, I often try and argue on behalf of the United States as this being a steep learning curve for us and something that we're really trying to aggressively learn and, and keep pace with really quickly. So I, I'd like just some of your views on how perspectives in Congress have, have evolved to appreciate um, sort of the need to tackle these things earlier rather than later, but then also some of the larger organizational challenges. So going forward, say we pass the bill or say we come to an agreement in Copenhagen, how does Congress and the government have to sort of change the way they think about these issues to be able to react, react in time? Well, sometimes um, I, when I'm in Congress, I feel like I'm in a, in a Star Trek episode and I've landed on a foreign planet that's alien to me. And the reason is, is we still have quite a number of people who refuse to accept the clear science on this issue. And it's stunning to me why that is. And a lot of those people are never going to accept this because they have this ideological bent that they think it's a communist plot to subvert, you know, the basic character of America. And they just – they got into that mindset, 
which is stunning to me because people will fly on airplanes that depend on modern science, and they'll use cell phones that depend on quantum mechanics, but then they'll refuse to accept the clear science of this issue. And, it, and I've, I've struggled with why that is, and I think it's, it's unfortunate because a lot of people thought this became some kind of partisan issue. I think it's very unfortunate. And the other is just fear. I think a lot of my colleagues and Americans are afraid that we can't solve this problem. And this is the reason I've been, I wrote this book, because I want to give people confidence, we, and we should have confidence we can solve this problem. If you don't think you can solve the problem, you tend to shy away from recognizing that it exists. So I think fear has been the fundamental reason why people will not accept the basic science. But let me suggest that in the debate in the next couple of months, the most important thing we will be talking about is not global warming and is not the Arctic. The most important thing for us to talk about during this time of economic recession is the job-creating potential of these policies. That is the singular most important thing to Americans right now. How do we build our economy? How do we create jobs? Where are the jobs going to come from to replace the ones that we have lost? And there is one and only one clear winner in the sweepstakes to figure out where those jobs are going to come from. They're going to come from the, uh, the bright source concentrated solar energy company that's building concentrated solar. They're going to come from the Clipper Wind Company who are building wind turbines in, in Iowa. They're going to come from the Alter Rock Company who are doing engineered geothermal uh, in Seattle. They're going to come from the McKinstry Energy Efficiency Company. This is clearly, without argument, the best strategy for creating jobs in this country that we have at our disposal. So I challenge anyone to come up with a better strategy on how to create jobs in this country than this one right here. So during the next two months, we are going to talk about jobs, frankly, much more than we're going to talk about global warming. Now, there will be a side benefit that will, might save the Arctic and not destroy the planet, which is a nice side, side benefit. But the main thrust and job of Americans in Congress right now for Americans is to respond to this economic uncertainty that we have. And the good news in, the good news is that these both exactly dovetail, the best economic policy right now happens to be, by coincidence, the best policy for our grandchildren in the long term. So we're going to focus on job creation, and I think that's the right approach to get this bill done, and it's the thing that people care about right now. And by the way, I mean, I just fully believe this. You can't, you can't turn the corner in America and not find a business person with an idea that if you can marry it with some capital has a chance to really create jobs in this country. I mean, literally, I don't go a day without meeting two people that have a new company, and maybe only one of three of them will succeed, but they all have potential to succeed to create jobs in this country. Now, I'll mention this other thing is, we need to reach an international agreement with our friends about how to move forward on climate change. So. When I make this other comment, it's not to diminish our friendship and alliances around the world. But Americans also respond to competition, right? The original moon race responded to the race with the, the Ruskies at that time, as we referred to them gently, uh, to get to the moon. It was a race. Well, right now, we are in an economic race with China to decide who's going to be dominant building lithium-ion powered cars. We are in a race with Germany to see who's going to, you know, build the advanced solar systems. We're in a race with Denmark and other countries, you know, about wind turbines. So far, they're way, you know, they got out of the gate before us. But we can catch up and eventually pass our friends. And that competitive instinct and self-interest is something we need to unleash, and I think we'll succeed ultimately in a friendly competition. And I believe we will be successful in Copenhagen. But it is critically important that America act first domestically. And I cannot envision sending a man who is the hopes of the world. You know, this, Barack Obama is pretty interesting. The people, I was talking to a guy in the Philippines the other day. The people in the Philippines are counting on Barack Obama's success. He is now a world inspirational figure. And I cannot imagine the prospect of America sending him to Copenhagen without a domestic success on this issue to take to Copenhagen. 
we owe him that, we owe ourselves that, we owe the world that, and, and, and that's why I think it's so important for us to get this bill done this year. And our intention is to get this bill out of committee by Memorial Day, and we're working on that uh, to do that. So I want to thank you for an opportunity to say hello. Uh, I hope you'll talk to any of your elected representatives about anything you think about this issue, pro or con, and um, look forward to uh, success. Thank you. And the Norwegians. <laughs> and the Norwegians. And the Norwegians. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Isley, and we better let you get back to your battle station. Yeah, I fear the Klingons may have landed and yeah. uh <laughs>